Hey there, Golden Bears. I hope you're keeping it classy, as I know you always have, will, and will continue to do so. This is Steger here for Module 8 6, The Cold War, and how it expands at home and beyond with the broad. So, as you remember, way back when, when Truman was in office, we have the Cold War uh, beginning to escalate. Well, now we're going to have President uh, Eisenhower coming into office. So, and what does that mean, and, and how does that uh, respond? Here is a quote from President Eisenhower where most historians think that when he was in office um, that he was actually a hard-charging military guy because he came from the military, while at the same time a hard-charging guy was about public works and programs, which is the opposite of what a, uh, the, the, a Republican would want. But uh, And then also another guy who you know spoke hardly against, harshly against many of the poor and the marginalized America, which he did do. So he's an interesting president that uh, America experienced tremendous amount of prosperity and low inflation, while at the same time, you know, wondering if we're gonna expand our power militarily against Russia during this time. But look at this quote from a president who is a Republican. Uh, it doesn't seem like a logical thing. He says, should any political party attempt to abolish social security unemployment insurance, and eliminate labor laws and farm programs, you would not hear of that party again in our political history. This is a Republican running for the Republican ticket who is trying to blend uh, FDR's programs along with those of Republican ideals. And we'll learn a little bit later here what he means by this idea of modern Republicanism. I'd like to start with a story that kind of lends itself nicely to how America is looking. Uh, and what America is experiencing in this time. Um, growing, uh, moving to the town of Hemet when we did, when I was nine months old, we moved there with no family uh, surrounding us. And so uh, my parents were quick to make friends with their neighbors and other people through, uh, whether through church or work or uh, maybe out of the country club. Uh, yeah, we were part of a country club, even though we were lower middle class, I guess it was still affordable in those days, I'm not so sure. Um, but we met the Loomis family, and I would go over to uh, Auntie uh, Betty's house uh, probably once or twice a week, and it was there that I would, as a young young boy, just always try to just walk around and see what's at the house that's new to look at and investigate, and it was there that uh, I discovered that they had a third floor, not above, but below. And so I asked uh, Auntie Betty, and I go, Auntie Betty, what do those two big doors lead to? She goes, oh, that's our bomb shelter. I go, a bomb shelter? What do you mean by that? Oh, you know, when the Russians come and try to blow us up with their nuclear bombs. And I was maybe like, you know, four or five. I'm like, I don't know what any of those things are. She goes, I go, but can I open up? She goes, oh, sure, go on in there. So I could barely lift one of the doors. I didn't need to bother with the second door. And then I walked down below into this musty basement where there along the walls I can see, you know, uh, uh, sh shelves of food and cans. I can see pre pre uh, jugs of water. I could see some cots were set up and everything else in this makeshift shelter that looked like it could fit about a family of, of four or five and enough room with some chairs and stuff in it. I thought, huh, that's kind of interesting. And so I come upstairs and I uh, go, do we have one at our house? She goes, oh no. You guys don't have the money to build a bomb shelter. And I go, oh, okay. I didn't think anything else about it until I got home that evening. It says, Aunt Betty says we don't have the ability to build a bomb shelter. She goes, no, you're right. Aunt Betty knows that we don't have the ability to build a bomb shelter. I go, so what happens when these things she said called nuclear bombs go off? She goes, oh, well, we're probably dead. And I thought, oh, <laughs> okay, as a matter of fact, about the whole thing. And so that's what I grew up in. and I. You know, I'll tell you stories perhaps of prior videos or subsequent videos that I'll be making of the duck and cover drills that we did and uh, planes flying over him at, from March Air Force Base 24 hours a day, practicing their runs to, to deliver fuel to the J the B-52 bombers that were up in the air 24 hours a day. I mean, it was crazy during that time period of the Cold War uh, living. But yeah, just see the, uh, yeah, okay, so we're going to die with, with nuclear of fallout <laughs> during this time. Well, during this time period, we also are beginning to see uh, uh, the world beginning to choose sides. And you can see that the blue ones there are American influenced or, or 
European NATO influence. Then on, there in the red, you can see the Russian and um, communist influence. Now, what you're recognizing is that China there is not considered red uh, because China still hasn't agreed, even though communist doesn't feel like they're going to align with, with either side. And then you have Africa that we're going to talk about a little bit later on uh, in this lecture. But notice there are little dots, either red or blue dots, that both either Russia or America has been sending out our own mil our CIA operatives or the KGB operatives uh, to, to kind of help dismantle, if you will, the countries that don't see the things the way that we want them to see and through the lenses that we have given them to see things. So with that, let us talk about the nuclear weapons and containment. Well, Eisenhower comes on the heels of, of President Truman and with that, there was very little uh, develop, development and changes in policy, both abroad and at home. And so this idea of Truman, if you remember, was the, the, the Truman Doctrine was to contain um, what was taking place. Eisenhower had a different mindset of this. He believes that, yes, communism was a threat, but this idea of throwing tons of money at these governments that just promised to do elections for us was not possible. It wasn't financially frugal to do. In fact, he argued that if we continue doing this, he might cause America to become bankrupt. Another thing that the Truman's policy did, any time that there was a skirmish, um, America would be there with our troops to kind of help calm the peace and let them know, reassure them that we'll be part of, of their idea. Eisenhower on the second bullet there recognized that this idea of the military industrial complex, it's found in your textbook there, would is essentially a makeup of large corporations, the military government paying for uh, these things, and research institutions like UC, uh, LA, Cal Berkeley, University of Chicago's, all of these major um, schools were there getting funds from the military and the government to develop these weapons that they wanted them to be developed. It was a great thing for the colleges because it helped them build and build and build and grow and grow and grow, pay their professors, while at the same time meeting the needs of the government. This military industrial complex that Eisenhower will label uh, basically uh, felt that this was bad for the long term of America. And in fact, when we get to his uh, farewell speech, he kind of attacks this thing that has been, that emerged kind of while under Truman and his watch. In response to this idea of Truman's doctrine, he comes up with this new look strategy saying, America should have a new look, not only across the globe, but also in its own home front. And he articulated that, wouldn't it be better for us to build massive missiles that we could put throughout Kansas and Oklahoma's and everything else and send them overseas to Turkey, send them to Greece, send them to um, Germany, and we build those theirs to, to uh, defend our interests of, um, of capitalism and democracy rather than having this huge military that uh, is there to meet the whims and needs of our various either neighbors or NATO partners. This new look strategy uh, seemed to be like a plausible means, he argued, that would be cheaper than continuing Truman's policy of just throwing money out at every whim. Now this idea, however, however created this idea of a massive retaliation. So whoever threatened us, whoever threatened NATO, Whoever threatened one of our countries that we are in partnership with and have uh, a pact with, we would do a massive retaliation against if there was any communist aggression. This tactic of new look strategy now pushed Russia onto the um, defense to begin building their uh, major missile systems just as much as we had begun developing our thing. Hopefully you can begin seeing this collision course taking place. I love this political cartoon here and how we're going to develop the H-bomb, then the Z-bomb, then the Y-rocket, and they're going to re respond with the same things. And soon what's going to happen with our next third world is we're just going to resort to bows and arrows type of thing if this continues to escalate as it has. This new look strategy did save money, but it had a flaw. Basically, it led to brinkmanship. What is that? Well, um, it forces 
things to escalate, 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 escalate. Whereas before under Truman and before that under FDR, you can send in troops to kind of help calm or or uh, suppress any sort of um, military action that was taking place there. This idea of then not getting involved, not sending soldiers over, which probably many Americans were tired of war, seemed good. It just escalated things at the political level to where ultimately it says, okay, fine, we're just gonna launch missiles towards you. And so th this idea um, probably, although good at the beginning, had a, de a definite consequence for America and Russia because this then put us on the path up towards the mad, mutually assured destruction and that we would continue building arsenal after arsenal after arsenal of these things to where, you know, at one point, you know, America had tripled the amount of, of these ICBMs, uh, intercontinental military uh, defense systems, uh, to assure that we would not be destroyed by Russia at this time. What does this mean? Is that America hears of this new look, hears of this, these missiles that we're making? What does this do? It puts Russia in defense and their people are freaked out. It makes America knows that Russia is beginning to build these same type of weapons. And so here you see a Houston family with their stockpile all proudly showing off their own shelter, just like my friend Betty Loomis did uh, with their shelter that they had built there uh, in, in their cool little farmhouse in little old H-Town. Well, the president um, did worry about um, this and, and, and bolstered kind of America's response. And this is where I can remember this turtle coming out. Uh, this is it, totally. There would be these posters around school and they showed us videos, literally, of what it looked like when the bombs would go off, the, the, the hydrogen bombs, and you'd see, you know, and then the next thing, you'd see this huge rushing, rushing wind just annihilating any sort of building in its way. And then they're like, okay, kids, it's time to duck and cover. And then, so we, then we would have to try and find our ways to slip underneath these chairs. And I can remember one time, it was either in, probably in fourth grade, Mrs. Steinbeck's class. And, and I, I raised my hand, I go, Miss Steinbeck, what's the point of these duck and covers when those buildings get annihilated and wiped out anyway? She sent me to the principal's office because I wasn't <laughs> going along with what the school wanted us to do. I was an outspoken critic, I said, but, I try to reason with the principal. He goes, Doug, you can't sit there and, and say those things to the teacher. Just duck and cover like the rest of us. I'm like, okay. I wish at this point I probably would have stood up, ah, just like we're all sheep being led to the slaughter. I didn't know that much, but that's why my brain would get me in trouble and my mouth because I would speak up too often in this situation. And so both sides um, of, the, of, the, of the world, Russian and America, continue to build and build and uh, develop and develop and launch these new hydrogen bombs into the air and, and not air but on the ground then you'd see the contaminants getting into the air. I mean just outside of Las Vegas in the Great Basin we would sit there and light off I don't know 10 to 12 a year to test them. Can you imagine that much radioactivity up and above in the atmosphere just outside of, of, of you know Las Vegas. Perhaps that's why Area 51 in New Mexico uh, is drawing so many <laughs> I say this jokingly, you know, uh, Martians and aliens to it, to do tests on, on us of how foolish we are. We're launching these weapons of mass destruction and see how they responded. Well, thankfully, Eisenhower had this um, bluff in hand where we had missiles there. And thankfully, he began relying on backdoor diplomacy, backdoor channels. Like, it would be like, making a, a TV proclamation to the news media, but at the same time um, working uh, behind closed doors on the phone call uh, and, and saying, hey, we, we don't need to resort to this type of thing. And there, uh, early in, in, in Eisenhower's tenure as president, Papa Bear Joe Stalin, uh, the one who killed more people than uh, Hitler put together, okay, over close to 30 million of his own people, died under his plans and under his uh, ideas for what progress would look like. And it took a couple of years for the Communist Party to sit there and finagle and jockey and position themselves to see who would be his replacement. Would it be another hardliner like Stalin or would it become one that would be more uh, willing to negotiate 
and um, be willing to uh, kind of work with the world leaders out there. And Khrushchev comes into power two years later, which thus relaxes some tensions between America and the Soviet Union. What made it even more valuable is that Khrushchev and the Russian uh, party, the Boyar Duma, uh, they basically said Stalin's totalitarian rule was wrong, did not reflect the ideals of what true communism was, and they recognized the wrongs that were done there. This then allowed this Cold War tension that had been building, 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 building um, to begin fine. And it was there that our vice president went over to visit uh, and have a debate about, called the kitchen debate, which is kind of a, a funny thing where um, uh, Vice President Nixon debated their premier Khrushchev about the merits and demerits of capitalism and communism, while at the same time there's Khrushchev in front of these beautifully hewn um, a bath, uh, I'm sorry, kitchens that um, are shiny and bright and modern and nothing like that had even existed in, in Russia at the time, okay? What made it interesting is that after that, for 12 days, their, their uh, premier Khrushchev came to America and toured, and you see that there was definite relationships being built. This idea of brinkmanship was thawing, and the world was beginning to breathe, and their collars were beginning to loosen. Well, just a few uh, weeks, if I'm not mistaken, uh, before our president was actually going to go back and visit, President Eisenhower, visit there in Russia. They then, they, the Russians shot down one of our U-2 bomb uh, planes. That It doesn't bomb, but it goes up and takes pictures from about 60,000 feet and, and, and shot one down, which again kind of created a soured relationship uh, between America and uh, Russia. Why would it sour? Here we were thawing our relationship with Russia and at the same time we're sending these spies planes up over their sovereign soil, okay, to take pictures to see if they're doing what they say they're doing. Uh, that's just not what you do uh, if you're trying to be good neighbors uh, with one another. So here's a picture of Nixon and here's a picture of Khrushchev. What I find interesting in the background right here is Lenoid Brezhnev. He will become their next premier once this guy here kicks the bucket in the party. So these guys are all the bigwigs that are listening in, talking about that. I love how this detergent here, this SOS, help. That was a marketing genius uh, there of all the things that were available uh, that Russia certainly did not have uh, at the time. Okay, now on to the second point. So while the Russians and the Americans are battling it out, you have the rest of the globe trying to figure out what are we going to do between these two big superpowers? Are we going to join them? Are we going to have our own uh, party? Are we going to uh, defy these two big leaders? Well, there is some interesting things that take place uh, during this time. After post-World War II, many of these parts of Africa, many of these parts of Southeast Asia declared that they wanted to have freedom away from this imperialistic um, countries of Europe and, and Europeans, uh, Frank, France and England and others, they had no money to sit there and, and govern these regions. And uh, so what you saw is a major movement of countries nationalizing themselves and kicking out their imperialistic um, owners, if you will. Okay, and so in Iran, Guatemala, and Cuba, uh, you find new leaders beginning to uh, take over what was once uh, dominated by their Euro European colonial powers. And so you, you'll begin, as you go through and read this section, you're going to read how in Iran um, a new leader emerged, and because of the oil there, America got involved, uh, so that way we can make sure that the investments we had put in there uh, would still come and line the pockets of Americans. In Guatemala, uh, dealing with fruit and bananas, frankly, okay, um, America stays involved because, um, frankly, uh, one of the uh, Secretary of State, Dulles, I think his name is, his brother-in-law is an investor in the Guatemalan company that gets taken away from them because of the nationalistic uh, revolution, if you will. And what does America do? We come in there and send in some secret forces known as the CIA, and soon that government gets toppled under the disguise, well, we got to protect this, the uh, 
the Panama Canal, because we can't let that go into someone else's hands. Cuba, um, you see Fidel Castro beginning to emerge during this time. And we, we uh, not we, but President Eisenhower begins coming up with plans for the CIA operative to come in and, and make sure that they don't take over control. Because when Fidel Castro emerges, he literally disbands all the American corporations that were there at the time. Over $1 billion worth of hotels were down there. Cuba was the playground for the wealthy and the rich of, of America that would go down there and enjoy these things. And so what happened is that many of these nations tried to remain neutral during the Cold War. And so about 26 nations, mostly from Africa, met in Bandung, and it is there that they declared that they're not gonna be involved with all these imperialistic countries in Africa and Southeast Asia and Latin America. They're gonna try and stay away from all of this type of thing um, simply because they did not like the aspect of what was represented by this. What does Eisenhower do? Just like what does Khrushchev do? They use their secret police or the, the spy agencies to continue to promote either American interests or communist interests in those countries. So here is uh, the Badung Conference uh, and, and who was part of that. And Eisenhower declares the NSC 68, which is found on page 705, and I lectured on that priorly, that they gave a reason why according to Eisenhower, why America should be, you know, have its influence to make sure um, they don't have countries lost to communism rather than staying pro-American at this time. So here's one in, in, in instance in Cuba that Fidel Castro leads this up overthrowing of Batista who was backed by the Americans during this time. And Castro then installs a communist regime. And before Eisenhower leaves office, he puts in the plan that we'll learn about later of the CIA to attempt an overthrow. Another instance in, in um, Egypt. Egypt gets its liberty uh, from, uh, from England. And, and in order to, two or three years later, Nasser, who is their kind of their new leader, is trying to find ways to redevelop the country. So he wants to dam, dam up a huge uh, Aswan uh, Lake, which was later named after him. And this, this dam was to electrify most of, of Egypt. Well, there's funds that were promised to him, both from America and from Russia. Um, America pulls out of the deal. And what results in this? Uh, kind of a fight uh, between uh, the, the Nile and, I'm sorry, Egypt and France and England. Why? Because in order to pay for this dam, um, Egypt says, well, let's take back the Suez Canal because that's in our... That's on our property. That's in the rights to England. What does this do? It infuriates Britain and France and they invade Egypt and along the same time throw in Israel for good measure. What does this convey there in the Suez Canal? You can see that, let me try to, uh, you know, look you up here in the right hand corner. See if I can move that out for a second. There you are, there's the Suez Canal that still is in operation today. But that Suez Canal, it was a battle over. What does this do? Russia stays out of the deal. And what does this do for Russia? It makes them look like, hey, they, as communists, they really do care about the small guy, the small potato, the small countries out there. They aren't the colonial empire or imperialists that these others are. And so actually, um, democracy in the capitalistic countries look like they got black eyes on this event here in, in trying to uh, connote things like this. This here is another joke that I'll talk about with my Steger Select of that. Well, during this time, Eisenhower recognizes that unless we begin um, getting involved in the Middle East, and because of the poor actions of what took place with by France and in England and, and in Israel, that we need to have a policy with to curb the growing spread of communism. And this is where the Eisenhower Doctrine comes into place. And this Eisenhower Doctrine still is used for today. Literally, it has influenced America's policy for 55 or 50, 60 years since this time. So what you need to be mindful of, if, you know, for the exam takers, that we had the Marshall Plan that ended World War II, and what did that do? Help rebuild Europe. Then we had the Truman Doctrine, which was about offering money to co countries that said, Hey, we will we will um, vote democratic, and and we will say that we will be uh, you know certainly not communist. Okay, now we have the Eisenhower doctrine 
which is only focusing here on the Middle East and how we can go about and making sure that our influence is there. And, and uh, this is a unique situation where then America declares the Congo uh, an interesting place. Why? Because their ally, Belgium, uh, uh, who uh, used to be the imperial power, this owner of the Congo, uh, we have vested interests there. Why? What's in the Congo region? Resources to build our military industrial complex. And uh, so because they have resources there for us, uh, we, we kind of send in uh, our CIA operatives there. We help topple the government. And then what is the result of this? Soon Congo gets split. And then we have a new country called Zaire, which happens to remain still to this day, a uh, country that is considered more democratic and more leaning toward the West than anything else, even though it was probably governed by a dictatorship for 20 to 30 years. Now let's look at how politics entered in under the Eisenhower years of his two-term life there. He coined this thing called modern republicanism, which is a way to kind of lift up the old stodgy, um, you know, arms crossed, we want individual rights. We don't like a lot of taxes. We like small government. All these things that Republicans have stood for. And he says, wait a minute. You know, I do want to be fiscally sound. I do want to protect our, our, our people and have a, a, a powerful government. But there are some things that we need to do to help the average Joe. And so he embraced under this new modern Republicanism some of the aspects of the New Deal. And so you'll see that he raises Social Security benefits, doesn't raise them, but expands them to where almost 10 million more people get them than what was under FDR's policy. Minimum wage is raised. Despite a Republican mindset it make government smaller, look what he did. He created new departments of health, education, and welfare. What does that mean? More people working for the sec secretary, I'm sorry, for the State Department, which means more and more government jobs, and we see a government expanding, expanding, expanding. He also did two key things that you and I benefit from every single day, all right? One of them is he had approved this National Interstate Defense Highway Act. 43,000 miles of, of highways were uh, designed, I have a picture of it here, under his Congress, okay, and expenditures. Why would Democrats love this? Because this creates jobs and helps transport us um, products across the nation. Why did Ike want this? If you'll note that every overpass has to be over a certain amount of height, I think it's 15.8 feet. Why? Because our intercontinental ballistic missiles on the bed of a semi truck need to have 15.8 inches, 15.8 you know feet uh, to go underneath them to be transported from let's say California to Chicago if they were to be launched or put into subs to be sent out like that. So it was a dual role on this thing, and Democrats were happy, Republicans were happy, because it had a twofold purpose. The other thing that our government passes during this time is the National Defense Education Act. What does this do? It mandates in colleges that you have English, history, and science, and it also begins giving more opportunities for graduate students to take out loans. Why was this done? Because Sputnik had just been sent up into the atmosphere. This little satellite was orbiting the Earth, spending out a little signal, ding, ding. And, and, and Americans responded like, wow, Russians have finally uh, escalated. They've gone beyond what America can do. That means we are behind educationally, and we need to do whatever we can to take back uh, you know, that, that uh, power, if you will, that Russia was having on display. Another thing that um, was taking place under Eisenhower is that he and Lyndon Baines Johnson, um, who was uh, working in the Congress right now, a very, very powerful man and during that time, he, he and Congress had to work together. Very interesting during Eisenhower's tenure is that Congress was always Democrat and he was a Republican, but he was able to work from both sides uh, of this aisle. And so, yeah, Eisenhower was known to, to work and support many um, civil rights agendas. For instance, he was the president when Little Rock Nine happened, we studied about that already, that sent in our um, military to make sure that this was supported. However, at the same time, he did some nasty things to our Native American Indians 
where they force them to relocate, take away their land. In fact, we have a dear family friend who's from a tribe up in um, um, Northern California, way, way up by Eureka, that uh, they go up only once a year. Does the government give them an opportunity to go to a park that used to be their tribal land, okay, but was taken from them under this Bureau of Indian Affairs thing where they were relocating them for their benefit. There were like two or three tribes that had this happen. A really sad scenario under the watch of Eisenhower and the democratically led Congress who was all about the African-American experience and helping them, but at the same watch, they're certainly taking away the rights of the Native, of the Native Americans. So here you can see in your textbook of the propaganda sent out by our government to say, oh, look how happy the kids are who are leaving the reservations and coming out here to, to Colorado or coming to LA to start life fresh and new. Here's another example. I don't even want to talk too much about this and how uh, America under Eisenhower's policy was to uh, forcibly remove, they believe, close to 1.3 Mexicans because of the Rosero program and they felt many of them didn't leave. Look at what they called this. Such a horrible uh, racist uh, thing um, done under the Eisenhower watch and under Democrat watch uh, who were supposed to be supporters of the poor and, and the downcast. Well, during his second term, Eisenhower begins doing something that Republicans are known for doing, is, is turning down and stop supporting various expenditures when they feel the government is exploding in its, in its, in its checkbook writing ability, okay? What do I mean by that? Most Republicans will want to have vote for larger military expenditures or take away uh, opportunities for those who are marginalized and poor. So again, here you see Eisenhower doing much the same thing. Hey, we're expanding school, colleges, we're expanding the military, things that they think are important, while at the same time, however, slashing funding for public housing, public works, and urban renewal to hopefully keep this balanced budget. So the and to conclude about Eisenhower, he did flourish, the economy did flourish, it overcame two recessions, the middle class grew, and however, there were close to 40 million Americans who were below the federal poverty line and there was no hope in the future to see them find ways to uh, grow from that. We're now going to turn our attention to the debate between um, you know, incoming John F. Kennedy and the vice president under Eisenhower, Richard Milhouse Nixon. This is an interesting, and I'll be brief on this, but there was an interesting thing where Nixon, the hardened um, polit political guy for life, uh, has been there since Republicans were fighting uh, for the country's s s sanctity during um, the, the Red Scare, to where now he took on Khrushchev and was a hardliner there, to this unknown, playboy -esque type of guy, Democrat and a Catholic, Many people in America at the time thought, boy, having a Catholic president might mean that the Pope is going to run the country, not the president themselves. And, and so many people assumed that Nixon, the Republican Party, would win because the Eisenhower and all of that, you know, they had a hard line against communism and, and were trying to make some good progress towards, uh, you know, meeting the needs of the average American uh, in terms of the wages increase and uh, those things I just talked about. However, Kennedy won simply because he was a young voice, didn't re represent the stodginess of the old school Republicans, but during the debates he was polished, well-spoken, understood how media worked. But the third thing or fourth thing we need to be mindful of is when MLK Jr. was arrested, it was, a, it was you know, Kennedy that had called and actually convinced uh, them to let him out of jail. And this phone call then um, caused MLK Jr.'s father to, as a pastor to begin recognizing maybe the Democrats, who typically are the most racist people against us, actually want to do some good. And so this Northern Democrat really does have us in mind. And so with that, this phone call, this message, almost 7% of the African American population that voted Republican the time before now switched over to Kennedy. What does this result in? Him gaining the, the vote and eventually winning the popular vote and, and uh, eventually the presidency. Well, I've talked about those things there. That leads us to now Kennedy inheriting some things that are left over, namely the Cold War 
that has gone from where it was under hardcore, you know, frigid, frigid cold under Truman, began to thaw in the middle with Eisenhower, then now it's even deepened into more of a cold of the freezer here, and he inherits this idea of uh, Cuba and what we're going to do about that type of thing. So at Kennedy then arrives in the first few months, he hears that the CIA has been planning this overthrow of, of Cuba, get rid of Fidel Castro, and the idea behind it was, why don't we train up about 1,500 of these uh, loyal um, to Cuban uh, hired weapons, if you will, and we'll send them down there, and while down there, they will uh, attempt to topple the, the, the Cuban president, for lack of a better word, or, or dictatorship. What America underestimated, and so did these 1,500 men, is that there were a lot of people who actually liked Castro and what he was doing than those of the American and rebels that they had supported. So less than three days later, these 1,500 men were pinned on a beach. That's why I call it the Bay of Pigs invasion. That's where they died. And America did not send down any sort of uh, support militarily, only 90 miles away, because uh, those were there as CIA operatives on their own, not uh, their representing type of thing. What resulted in this Bay of Pigs disaster is that um, the, the tensions between the West and these continued and Khrushchev uh, begins building the Berlin Wall, separating the poor and the wealthy, you know, and, and it really creates that major division that Churchill talked about uh, much earlier in the time period that we mentioned here uh, of this, you know, Iron Curtain. And the Iron Curtain was just symbolic. Now we're seeing it come to life in the reality. And so here you see, um, you know, just some more pictures of how America um, then begins to be concerned in hearing stories with our U-2 spy plans going over Cuba and we discover um, there are arsenals of missiles being uh, you know, put together that just less than 90 miles away if you were talking about uh, the tip of Florida out on the islands or 234 miles away to Miami and you can see the mileage broken out there. Not that hard to do and, and what resulted in this is that America had to make a choice and Kennedy had to make a choice. Do we want these missiles in literally our backyard or do we continue to let them doing what they want? And this is where um, Kennedy, whoo, it, he just had the Bay of Pigs where things went wrong. Now he needs to have another opportunity where he steps up to look like a hardliner. He tells Khrushchev that your job, you need to turn back. Khrushchev denies it, doesn't acknowledge it. We then send out our military boats and we essentially create a line. And, and then Kennedy says, if your boats cross that line, war will happen. Thankfully, Khrushchev boats turn around, they go back to Russia, and in exchange for that, um, Khrushchev removes his missiles, and Kennedy promises not to invade Cuba so they can have their autonomy there. And quietly, Kennedy doesn't acknowledge this type of thing, but at the same time, we begin dismantling our bombs that we have there in Turkey, which was actually more of a bigger deal for Russia to begin with at that. And the last thing that this helped trigger is that we begin signing these treaties that prohibited the atmospheric uh, testing, which was good for everybody because Russia was testing all of theirs. We were testing all of ours and it didn't matter if we had bombs going off in each other's backyards. You know, the skies above us were, were so glowing that, that we, we needed to have that. So as you can recognize, under Eisenhower's tenure, um, America um, prospered for the most part. There was tremendous peace for the most part. There were uh, civil rights groups that were being heard and, and given help. But at the same time, you had Eisenhower who was attacking uh, the institutions saying that if we continue building at the rate that we're doing, we will become, um, uh, we will lack any money. We will grow bankrupt during this time. And then along comes uh, Kennedy, who, who is elected into office, and this Cuban Missile Crisis continues to escalate, escalate, escalate uh, these ideas of what happens when you have two major powers with weapons pointed at each other. So with that, Golden Bears, keep it classy, and we'll be seeing you next time.